there are very few teams in the NBA that have turned their season around quite as much as the Dallas Mavericks. From the start of the season to the end of the 2021 calendar year, they would record a record of only 17 and 18. But since the new year has begun, the Mavericks have looked like a completely different team, going 27 and 10 over this stretch of games. There was all sorts of backlash after the Mavericks traded away Kristaps Porzingis in favor of acquiring Spencer Dinwiddie and Davis Bertans. It was really easy to look at this move and make fun of it, because at the time, both Spencer Dinwiddie and Bertans had been playing terribly in Washington. However, this trade seems to have made the Mavericks better, with Spencer Dinwiddie looking like a completely different player than the one he looked like in Washington. In top to bottom, this entire roster seems to have an incredible understanding of their roles, and they're all bought in on both the offensive and defensive end. Maybe I'm crazy, but I think the Mavericks are a much bigger threat in the Western Conference that I think a lot of people are giving them credit for right now, and I'm going to be explaining why in this video. But really quick, only 5% of the people who watch my videos are subscribed to my channel, so if you love the NBA and you enjoy this video, why not consider hitting that subscribe button? It's free, and it helps me out a ton and allows me to continue making content. With all of that being said, let's get right into it. This team is a lot different than the Luka Doncic-led teams that we've seen over the past few years. You'd think that a team with Luka Doncic at the helm would hang their hat on their offensive ability, but that's not necessarily the case with this year's Mavericks team. This team has become one of the premier defensive teams in the league since the new year, recording the third best defense in the NBA with a defensive rating of 108.3 points per 100 possessions. Last night in their win against the Timberwolves, some of that defense was on full display. I want you to pay attention to how their defense prepares for the drive on this play. Anthony Edwards is going to get past Bullock, Powell and Brunson do this really interesting thing where they almost move as a line in sync with one another on Edwards drive. Powell acts as the first line of defense with Brunson providing supplementary help on the drive. When Edwards kicks it out, Dorian Finney-Smith is there to close out and get a contest on the shot and it results in a miss. I really like how they guarded the pick and roll last night as well. You're going to see how the Mavericks manipulated the Timberwolves into operating the pick and roll in a way that benefited the Mavericks. Bullock is angling his body to force D'Lo to not even use the screen that Cat is setting, and Powell is playing in drop coverage off of the screen. With Bullock making this left side wall on D'Lo, he can't get an easy open pass to Cat, and Cat is forced to drive in order to get open. And then when D'Lo gets the ball to Towns, Powell has an easy job of of just switching his feet and defending the layup to get the block. They completely shut down the pick and roll last night, even though the Timberwolves are one of the best pick and roll teams in the NBA. This isn't a case where they were just matched up well against Minnesota and able to shut down their pick and roll either. They've been doing this to every team all year. The Mavericks are the fifth best team in the NBA at defending the pick and roll, allowing only 0.96 points per possession. The way they utilize Dwight Powell and drop coverage and their willingness to funnel teams into the paint and force them to improvise is one of their biggest strengths. This has massive implications for the playoffs when teams are relegated to half-court offenses when the game slows down in the postseason. The teams with great half-court defenses are going to be the ones that succeed the most. I also got to give credit to Jason Kidd. He's done a great job at getting everyone to buy in to this defensive game plan, and it's been incredibly effective throughout the season, and it bodes really well for them in the playoffs. Now, on the other side of the ball, the Mavericks have gotten the most out of their pieces, despite not having the most star-studded supporting cast around Luka. Spencer Dinwiddie has been a revelation for them. He truly does look like a completely different player since his arrival in Dallas. He was putting up only 12.6 points per game on 31% shooting from 3 on 5.1 attempts per game in Washington. With the Mavericks, he's putting up 17.6 points per game on 38.2% shooting from 3 on almost 5 attempts per game. He's doing that on 61.6% .6 true shooting. Spencer Dinwiddie is a great example of how being in a bad situation can impact your on-court production. Now that he's in a better situation in Dallas where he's being utilized correctly, it's showing up in his production. He's already hit two game winners over the span of a week in his very short career with the team. 
I really like this acquisition because he provides them a little bit of height at the guard position. Brunson is awesome, don't get me wrong, but Dinwiddie gives them just a little bit more length on the defensive end and he can operate in some different roles. One thing that I appreciate as well is that Spencer Dinwiddie and Jalen Brunson don't cancel each other out. You can stagger their minutes and even put them on the floor together and allow Luka to rest while still having enough scoring on the floor to help keep you afloat. Also, let's talk about how awesome Dorian Finney-Smith has been. It's time that we start talking about him as one of the top 3 and D guys in the NBA because he's legitimately one of the best. He's one of the only guys in the entire NBA shooting over 40% from both the left corner and the right corner on more than one attempt per game from each spot. This is the perfect player to put into an offense that's so heavy on driving and kicking because he's almost always available in the corner. Not only is he fully capable of knocking down his open threes, but he's a good enough of a finisher that he can also be the one driving into the paint if the opportunity is available for him to score. Plus, he's just an incredibly impactful defender. According to Basketball Index, he's one of the best on-ball perimeter defenders and off-ball defenders in the entire NBA. He plays such a huge role in their defensive success, oftentimes being the guy guarding the best player on the opposing team, and he usually does a really good job at it. He complements this three-point heavy offense that Jason Kidd has constructed, and at the forefront of that offense, of course, is Luka Doncic. His play since the trade deadline has been nothing short of MVP caliber. That's not an exaggeration, it's just the truth. He's been playing legitimately the best basketball of his entire career since the team was reshuffled and Porzingis was sent to Washington. He's putting up 32.3 points, 9.7 rebounds, and 7 assists on almost 60% true shooting. He's been the third highest scorer in the NBA since the trade deadline, while also being top 10 in rebounds and top 10 in assists. Him and Kevin Durant are the only players that rank top 10 in all three of those categories since the trade deadline. He's been scoring incredibly well, using his ball handling ability to attack the basket and carve up defenses. He's been creating his own shot from beyond the arc, and that three-point shot is finally starting to fall for him. His playmaking over the stretch, though, has been what's really impressed me a lot. I've noticed this really interesting thing that the Mavericks do, and it's not something a ton of teams are willing to do, nor do they have the patience for. The Mavericks are typically willing to burn 90% of the shot clock, hunting for a good shot. They don't just take the first look that they get. They will continuously move the ball, driving and kicking until they finally get a high percentage look, even if it means the shot clock only has two or three seconds left. This type of offense is gonna be much more translatable to a playoff setting. The game is gonna slow down, defenses are gonna be playing tighter, and everyone is gonna be forced to play offense in a half-court setting. The Mavericks have one of the best half-court offenses in the NBA, so carrying this over into the playoffs really won't be a big issue for them. Also, I wanna shout out Luka's defense real quick. Luka has always been labeled as a bad defender, but honestly, he really hasn't been that bad this year. I'm even inclined to call him a good defender. He's fit really well into their defensive scheme, and he's putting in a level of effort that I don't think we've seen from him before. Everyone thought that the Mavericks needed a second star next to Luka, but I'm starting to wonder, are we sure that he does need a second star? The Mavericks are surrounding him with high quality role players, and although they could definitely upgrade around the edges, if they just keep surrounding him with good shooters and good defenders, they might be able to compete just fine. The difference between the Mavericks heliocentric offense around Luka and heliocentric offenses that we've seen in the past is that they normally sacrifice defense in favor of putting all of your chips in on offense. That's just not the case for the Mavericks. They're looking like an offensively potent team while also playing really, really good defense. Considering how well their defense and offense should carry over to the postseason, I think that they're a bigger threat in the West than people realize. Luka is hungry to get out of the first round, and there's a ton of question marks with some of the other teams in the Western Conference. They're closing in on a top four seed. They could be a huge problem for any team that they run into in the playoffs, and it wouldn't surprise me one bit if I woke up and saw that the Mavericks were in the Western Conference Finals. Luka is that good, and their team as a whole is that good. So do you think that the Mavericks are sleepers for the NBA Finals? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. Like I mentioned earlier, only 5% of the people who see my videos are subscribed. So if you like this video, be sure to subscribe and leave a like. It's free and it helps me out a ton. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.